that time, the Saxons strengthened in multitude and grew in Britain. On the death of Hengist, Octa, his son, passed from the northern part of Britain to the kingdom of the Kentish men, and from him arose the kings of the Kentish men. Then Arthur fought against them in those days with the kings of the Britons, but he himself was leader of the battles. Through 14 centuries, the shadowy but powerful figure of Arthur has been distorted by poets, chroniclers, politicians and kings. The image has been used for entertainment and even propaganda. From a Romano-British warlord fighting the Saxon invaders, he had been turned, in an ironic twist, into the most English of kings, epitomizing the full flowering of medieval chivalry. So there are two Arthurs, the armor-plated king enthroned in Camelot at his round table, surrounded by goodly knights and fair ladies, dispensing justice and defending the weak and oppressed. And the real Arthur, a military commander, a capable strategist and diplomat, as he would have needed to be in such turbulent times. It's possible he may not even have been of noble birth, making it easier for him to stand aside from the tribal differences and the squabbles of petty kingdoms. He was instead a man who could command a large, highly mobile force of cavalry and infantry, crossing all tribal frontiers, making all territories his battlefield against the Saxon foe. After the death of Uther Pendragon, the leaders of the Britons assembled from their various provinces in the town of Silchester and there suggested to Debricius, the Archbishop of the City of the Legions, that as their king, he should crown Arthur, the son of Uther. Necessity urged them on, for as soon as the Saxons heard of the death of Uther, they invited their own countrymen over from Germany, appointed Colgrin as their leader, and began to do their utmost to exterminate the Britons. They had already overrun all that section of the island which stretches from the River Humber to the sea named Caithness. Dubricius lamented the sad state of his country. He called the other bishops to him and bestowed the crown of the kingdom upon Arthur. Arthur was a young man, only 15 years old, but he was of outstanding courage and generosity, and his inborn goodness gave him such grace that he was loved by almost all the people. But how could this highly successful British general have become the fanciful king of medieval legend? The answer lies partly with Geoffrey of Monmouth, a Welsh cleric of Breton descent, who was responsible for bringing Arthur to a wider audience by writing his History of the Kings of Britain in 1136. This work, properly titled The Historia Regum Britannia, was written in Latin and can be fairly described as one of the most influential books on Arthur. Well, Geoffrey of Monmouth was a fibber, I'm afraid. Uh, as his name betrays, he um, was a monk at Monmouth, and then he moved to Oxford. And he was so keen on the Arthurian story that he was actually nicknamed Arthur, Geoffrey Arthur. And he was a real Arthur um, fanatic. And he wrote this book, which was published in the sense that manuscript editions were published in 1139, uh, and it purports to be a history of Britain from the day that the first settler, Brutus, a Trojan, landed in Britain at Totnes, and they used to show his footprint there about the time just before the Trojan War, and came right up to about um, the end of the um, um, seventh century AD. And he gives you conversations between prehistoric monarchs from the Bron what would have been the Bronze Age or the early Iron Age, and uh, every adventure and in every age he knows what's going on, but it's a, a marvellous read and uh, that's what made it um, perhaps the greatest bestseller of the Middle Ages. <laughs> 
And I think he was doing the job, a fair job, as he saw it. He had, you do sense a twinkle in his eye when you're reading it. At one point he says that um, an eagle on the walls of Gloucester uttered a prophecy, he said, which I would tell you if I believed it was true. Well, later on he goes and tells you. So <laughs> uh, I don't think he cared if you believed or not. And I'm, he may have been surprised at the extent to which people believed it. History Hit is an award-winning streaming platform built by history fans for history fans. Enjoy our rich library of documentaries covering key events and locations of the medieval period. History Hit's medieval offering features leading historians such as Dan Jones, Eleanor Yanega and Kat Jarman. Not only that, but we've a rich library of audio documentaries covering every period of history through our network of podcasts. Sign up now for a free trial and Chronicle fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code CHRONICLE at checkout. Geoffrey's History of the Kings of Britain might have seemed, on the face of it, a serious attempt to record British history and more particularly to portray an accurate picture of Arthur drawn from many reliable sources. After all, Geoffrey was a churchman who had received an excellent education for his time. But it would seem that Geoffrey entered the church in order to further his literary ambitions and not because of any religious zeal. Having no recognized archaeological authorities to hold him in check, Geoffrey was free to create an Arthur in the image of his own royal patrons. Whenever I have chance to think about the history of the kings of Britain. On those occasions when I've been turning over a great many such matters in my mind, it has seemed a remarkable thing to me that, apart from such mention of them as Gildas and Bede had each made in a brilliant book on the subject, I have not been able to discover anything at all on the kings who lived here before the incarnation of Christ, or indeed about Arthur, and all the others who followed on after the incarnation. Yet. The deeds of these men were such that they deserved to be praised for all time. What is more, these deeds were handed joyfully down in oral tradition, just as if they had been committed to writing by many peoples who had only their memory to rely on. Geoffrey obviously felt little or no need to depict Arthur as he'd encountered him in the writings of the 8th century chronicler Nennius. Thus, his Arthur dresses and acts exactly as a 12th century monarch and his descriptions of warfare and the social scene are based on his own experience. Geoffrey's intention, as far as we can tell, was not to deceive, but to entertain. He was as enthralled by the enigma of Arthur as many before him had been. With true Celtic exaggeration, he romanticized Arthur in a way that had never before been so blatant or so successful. That success was to spark off the development of a legendary Arthur. At a time when I was giving a good deal of attention to such matters, Walter, Archdeacon of Oxford, a man skilled in the art of public speaking and well informed about the history of foreign countries, presented me with a certain very ancient book written in the British language. This book, attractively composed to form a consecutive and orderly narrative, set out all the deeds of these men from Brutus, the first king of the Britons, down to Cadwallader, the son of Cadwallo. At Walter's request, I have taken the trouble to translate the book into Latin, although, indeed, I have been content with my own expressions and my own homely style, and I have gathered no gaudy flowers of speech in other men's gardens. If I had adorned my page with high-flown rhetorical figures, I should have bored my readers, for they would have been forced to spend more time discovering the meaning of my words than in following the story. In the eight centuries that have passed since Geoffrey of Monmouth completed his great work, other writers and poets have been inspired to compose new tales of Arthur, adding fashionable elements such as courtly love and deeds of heroism based on a code of medieval chivalry. Chrétien de Troyes, the French poet, writing just 30 years after Geoffrey, added the important new ingredients of the Grail and many new knights as part of Arthur's court, notably Sir Lancelot. He is also responsible for naming Arthur's stronghold as Camelot, a name he may have borrowed and corrupted from the Roman name for Colchester, Camelodunum. Robert de Boron, writing around 1200, introduced the concept of the sword in the stone, 
and in the generations that followed, author after author added to the story, embroidering and inventing, culminating in Sir Thomas Mallory's Mordatha, and nearer to the present, Tennyson's Idylls of the King. These are all celebrations of an Arthur many times removed from the man who united the British against the heathen Saxons. There was undoubtedly an Arthur long before Geoffrey wrote and he'd picked up a real character. And so are some of the others. For instance, um, Guinevere uh, appears in Welsh stories, which are certainly older than Geoffrey of Monmouth, as uh, Gwenhuiva. And um, some of the knights appear too, like Kay and Bedivere, who are Kai and Bedwyr. Uh, but Lancelot doesn't, unfortunately. He comes clearly from a French um, stories written at the end of the 12th century, slightly later. Though that again includes very old myths of the Lady of the Lake and so forth. Um, the, the Sword and the Stone, I'm sure, is older and must represent an, an ancient myth which you find in other cultures. The um, Round Table, I think, must also go back to very old ideas. To me, the most striking episode, and the one which most people remember, which I'm sure is very much older, and that is the mysterious birth of Arthur, which people will remember when um, Uther Pendragon is disguised by Merlin's magic as the husband of the beautiful Igerna on Tintagel, and he sleeps with her that night, and that night has begotten the infant Arthur, who's later born and becomes king. Um, <clears throat> well, that's a very old story, much older than Geoffrey of Monmouth. Before Geoffrey romanticised and popularised him, Arthur was a name heard in songs and folk tales, remembered and passed on around the winter firesides of those in whom the Celtic blood still ran strong. Small wonder then, perhaps, that his story was so helpful and so flattering to Henry I and to his bastard son Robert. What better ancestor for a Norman king to claim than Arthur? most renowned and heroic of all the kings who ruled before the Saxons. After all, in Geoffrey's time, it was generally believed by folk that Arthur had actually been anointed and crowned King of England a mere 600 years before. Arthur himself put on a leather jerkin worthy of so great a king. On his head he placed a golden helmet with a crest carved in the shape of a dragon and across his shoulders a circular shield called Pridwen, on which there was painted a likeness of the Blessed Mary, Mother of God, which forced him to be thinking perpetually of her. He girded on his peerless sword called Caliburn, which was forged in the Isle of Avalon. But who was the real Arthur? In truth, hardly anything of him is known, and prior to the 12th century, his name occurs so rarely in manuscripts and historical records that it is difficult to understand how his fame has endured. There are only a handful of references to Arthur, the earliest being a fleeting acknowledgement of his skill in battle, which occurs in a 6th century poem by Anarin called Egododin. He fed black ravens on the ramparts of the fort, although he was no Arthur. The warrior referred to in these lines, having reduced vast numbers of the enemy to carrion, is nevertheless deemed by the poet as unable to match Arthur's reputation. It's extraordinary to think that Anarin may have written these words within one or two generations of Arthur's lifetime. The Godothan is um, a North British poem, that's to say it was written in a language um, similar to modern Welsh, uh, and which a modern Welshman can in part uh, still understand, um, probably uh, in the second half of the 6th century, uh, when people spoke a language, the ancestor of present-day Welsh, from the, river, the, from the Channel up to the River Forth in Scotland. And it tells about a King Minnethaug of Edinburgh, whose army set forth, 300 of them, and marched all the way south to Catterick in Yorkshire and fought a glorious battle against the um, English invaders, and there they um, were killed, but they died gloriously, as in the charge of the Light Brigade. And then this poem was written uh, to commemorate them. Uh, it's the source of much controversy amongst Welsh scholars, but I think the general agreement is that uh, the nucleus of it was a real poem written by a poet called Anairin in the 6th century. And the interesting part from an Arthurian point of view is that it does at one point actually mention Arthur. Although the first mention of Arthur may have been in Egodidin, there is an earlier record of 5th century Britain 
but Arthur's name does not appear in it. It was written by the monk Gildas in about the year 540, and in it he denounces the rulers of his time and explains how Britain came to be in such a sorry state. Its title is The Ruin of Britain, and it's an outright attack on the wickedness of the authorities and clergy of his day, and in the preface to the work, he tracks down the causes of that wickedness. In so doing, he provides a unique account of 5th century Britain, a backdrop to the rise of Arthur, yet one from which Arthur was strangely absent. This angry old monk took a dim view of the squabbling of the local British rulers, and he felt, with some justification no doubt, that their lack of moral fibre had both led to the supremacy of the heathen Saxon invaders and been punished by it. He likened the British plight to that of the Israelites, and he saw their predicament as divine retribution. Gildas was a northerner, possibly a Pict born on the wrong side of the Roman frontier, but lived most of his life in the south, and in that fact may lie the answer to his silence about Arthur. As a Pict, he may have had no love for a commander who spent his time driving back the Picts, who'd been a thorn in the British side for generations. In fact, the Picts had often allied with the Saxons and the Irish, causing yet more trouble for the British. Gildas was um, a cleric writing in the 6th century, and so he is unique and extraordinary from an Arthurian point of view because there is somebody whom no historian doubts was actually writing, and we do have his writing uh, from the, about the, sometime in the first half of the 6th century. Uh, but what's disappointing is that he doesn't mention Arthur. This has been taken by some historians to disparage the whole Arthurian story and to say, well, if the one person living at the time who wrote about it in some depth and who was lived um, within the time of people who would have actually known him and doesn't mention him, then how can anyone suggest he lived? He seems quite clearly, for reasons which I don't think we'll ever know, not to, to be able to tell you about certain things. For example, it's an absolutely undoubted fact that the Anglo-Saxon invaders were in possession of a very large part of eastern and southern Britain at this time. Yet you wouldn't know that from Gildas. So it's not extraordinary that he doesn't mention something very important. He doesn't tell you about the kings of North Britain who were reigning at that time. He's writing under some political stress, it seems to me that's quite clear, and that he, and that he ha could very easily have a reason for not writing about Arthur. Up until the early 400s, Britain had been prosperous and sophisticated. A true Roman province in which all freeborn Britons were Roman citizens and proud to be so. British society was headed by landed gentry in whose veins ran the blood of Celt, Roman and in some instances a mixture of other nationalities from the Roman world. There was a thriving agricultural and industrial economy due to Roman efficiency and organisation, which had controlled the province of Britain for just under four centuries. The breathtaking spectacle of a horde belonging to a prosperous Romano-British family of the time was recently uncovered in Suffolk. The exquisite workmanship and richness of the jewellery and the household items revealed bear witness that the owners of this treasure were living in style. None of this changed immediately when Rome severed its links with Britain in the year 410. When the Roman Emperor Honorius told Britain to look to its own defences, the former province was remarkably successful in doing just that, at least for a generation. Gildas attributes this continuing peace to the reign of a supreme ruler he names as Vortigern, and this expression is not a name or even a title, but is thought to have been a description rather like a nickname, as in the Celtic tongue it means overlord or high king. He became high king of southern Britain in about 425. At first, Vortigern did better than other petty rulers who had sprung up all over the country after the break with Rome. His nickname indicates that he had the support of the poorer classes as well as the aristocracy from whom he came. Otherwise, he would have been known by a Roman name. So it seems that because he could call upon the allegiance of such a large cross-section of the population, he maintained authority for almost a generation. But even Vortigern, with his widespread support, could not gather enough military strength to counter the ever-increasing pressures of all his frontiers.
Vortigern had the idea, unwise as it later turned out, of employing a bunch of violent Jutish mercenaries, led by two brothers called Hengist and Horsa. Then came three keels, driven into exile from Germany. In them were the brothers Horsa and Hengist. Vortigern welcomed them then and handed over to them the island that in their language is called Thanet. Vortigern earned himself the undying hatred of the British for his mistake. These mercenaries were allowed to settle and within 20 years or so were abusing their hosts' hospitality and then rebelled against their British masters in the revolt of 441. Gildas goes on to say, all their inhabitants, bishops, priests and people were mown down together while swords flashed and flames crackled. Horrible it was to see the foundation stones of towers and high walls thrown down. There was no burial save in the ruins of the houses or in the bellies of the beasts and birds. Indeed, excavations in Caister by Norwich have revealed 36 charred bodies from that terrible time, found in the remains of a burnt-out building, silent witness to the ferocity of their Jutish attackers. Others had fled, never to return. Vortigern had let the Saxons in by the back door and would never be forgiven for it. In fairness, he had little choice in the matter, beset on all sides with no other hope of defence. The practice of hiring German mercenaries was by no means a new one. Indeed, the Romans had themselves done it, and there is much archaeological evidence for settlements of Angles and Saxons under Roman rule in Britain. By Arthur's time, the word Saxon had come to mean a multitude of Germanic settlers. And indeed, the modern word Sassanact is still used by the Scots today as a derogatory term for the English incomers. So, this is the world that Arthur grew up in. A world in which the Saxon expansion threatens still further a Britain destabilised without the protective cloak of Rome. The great country houses and estates of southern Britain were left to the wind and the rain. Large-scale farming and industry ran slowly down as the roads that the Romans had built became more and more unsafe. The Dark Ages, um, I must say to me, sometimes unconsciously conveys the idea of it's being almost always midwinter. Um, it really means a period of which we don't know very much. Uh, uh, it is also a period after the Roman occupation, when the legionary forces were withdrawn at the, end of the, at the beginning of the um, fifth century, when Britain was left to her own devices, and when we know that eventually the Engl ancestors of the English, who were uh, heathen barbarians, overtook and clearly ruined most of the island. Uh, the Roman fortresses were uh, destroyed and the villas um, fell into decay. But what we don't know is exactly how long this process took, and there's great disagreement among archaeologists and historians. Now, my own view, very briefly, uh, based on what I'm, uh, the latest discoveries, is that, um, that some form of Roman tradition did continue for a considerable time, probably maybe two th or three generations, um, it probably quite likely, I think, into the 6th century. And Gildas, whom I mentioned earlier, talks about people with um, Roman ranks, about uh, rectores, rulers, judges, and so forth, we find an inscription of um, five, the year 540 in North Wales, which refers to the, the, cons, the consular date at which the king died. So there were, a lot of Roman tradition went on. Most of the towns and cities deteriorated. Some decayed. Some were stripped bare. Others simply disappeared. It was truly the beginning of Britain's Dark Age. Petty warlords sprang up all over Britain, and inevitably the tribal violence which had lain dormant under centuries of Roman rule erupted with a new vigour. Leaders rose and fell at an astonishing rate, and the rule of law was no longer respected. More and more people fled to the towns and cities as supplies failed, some choosing migration to northern Gaul, others preferring to seek refuge in the newly refortified strongholds of their ancestors. Famine and plague claimed many. One such deserted Roman city is described in the earliest known Anglo-Saxon poem. Snapped roof trees, towers fallen, 
the work of the giants, the stonesmiths mouldereth. Rhyme scoureth gate towers, rhyme on mortar. Shattered the shower shields, roofs ruined, age underate them. And the wielders and the rights. Earth grip holds them, gone, long gone. Fast in graves grasp, while fifty fathers and sons have passed. Wall stood, grey lichen, red stone, kings fell often. The first serious historical documents in which Arthur is named were compiled meticulously by a Welsh monk in Bangor, North Wales. He's known to us as Nennius, and he was not the author of these documents. We might say he was the editor. But he himself admits in his preface to his History of the Britons in about 829 that his method of working was haphazard. I, Nennius, disciple of Elvodigus, have taken the trouble of writing down a few fragments which refute the stupidity of the British race of which they are accused. Because their learned men had no knowledge and had not written in books any record of that island of Britain. But I have made a heap of all that I could find, both in the Roman annals and in the chronicles of the Holy Fathers, that is, Jerome, Eusebius, Isidore and Prosper, and also from the annals of the Irish and Saxons and from the traditions of our elders. Like Gildas before him, Nennius was a monk, but he had few literary aspirations, and he confined himself to arranging the assortment of ancient documents in what he thought was their true historical order. Whether he was as gripped by the figure of Arthur is not recorded, but by the 9th century when Nennius compiled the documents he had found, Arthur had become a folk hero, especially in Nennius's native Wales. Amongst those documents, the two most important are the Annals of Wales and Nennius's History of the Britons. The Annals are thought to contain accounts from 5th and 6th century history copied down at around 800. So they may have been altered at any time by monk copyists censoring or adding to text as they saw fit. People are very curious and often ask um, people like myself who are studying this period what sort of evidence there is. Well, in a sense, there's very little. The direct sources used by historians are very few, and we've, made, we've canvassed most of them. The only one we haven't, um, I haven't mentioned so far is um, the history of the Britons, which um, used to be attributed to Nennius, um, which is the most important, which was written in the year 829 in its present form. Um, but there's actually very little. There's the mention in um, the Godothin. There are other early Welsh verses. There's a Welsh poem in, uh, about Geraint, the Prince of Devon, which is uh, later than Arthur's time, but mentions Arthur. So there's not a great deal, but uh, what there is, is is highly suggestive. And there are other ways of examining the evidence. There is, of course, archaeology doesn't really tell us very much, unfortunately. It tells us a great deal about the conditions of life, to some extent about political conditions, because we can fortresses have been excavated and so on, but we don't really, for the most part, know who lived in those fortresses. And we don't really know whether Arthur lived in one or another. But what we do have is the history of the Britons, which in the year 800 records Arthur's 12 great battles. Most of the sites are not very easy. In fact, none of them is identified for certain. That, to my mind, is a bit of an argument for saying they're genuine, because it seems to me a forger would have um, picked on known and, and well-known sites of the period. He doesn't. Uh, and to the extent that they can be satisfactorily identified, they do appear the sort of places you might expect battles at the beginning of the 6th century. In those days... The Saxons increased in numbers and grew stronger in Britain. But at Hengist's death, Arthur, his son, went from the northern part of Britain to the kingdom of Kent, and from him arose the kings of Kent. Then Arthur fought against those men in those days with the kings of the Britons, but he was the leader of battles. The first battle was in the mouth of the river which is called Glyne. 
the second and third and fourth and fifth, on another river which is called Dubglas and is in the region Linnewis. The sixth battle on the river called Bassas. The seventh battle was in the forest of Celidon, that is Cat Coet Celidon. The eighth battle was at the fort of Gwynion, in which Arthur carried the image of the Blessed Mary Ever Virgin on his shoulders. And the pagans were put to flight, and there was a great slaughter of them by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the grace of the Blessed Mary the Virgin, his mother. The ninth battle was fought in the city of the Legion. He fought the tenth battle on the shore of the river, which is called Tribruet. The eleventh battle was on the mountain called Agned. The twelfth battle was at Baden Hill, where 960 men perished at one charge of Arthur's, and no one killed them save he himself. And in all the battles he was victor. And they, when they were defeated in all the battles, sent for help to Germany, and their numbers were ceaselessly added to. And they brought kings from Germany to rule over those in Britain. It's clear from Nennius's account that Arthur was an experienced military campaigner, and Nennius always refers to him using the Latin word for soldier, miles, pronounced miles, rather than calling him king. It's even possible that Arthur may not have been a name, but an epithet as Vortigen was. Some have claimed the name Arthur stems from the Roman name Artorius. A Roman officer called Artorius Justus served in Britain in the 3rd century. But Arthur is not an unusual Celtic name of this time either. Another uh, suggestion which historians have advanced some, for some time is um, that the fact that a number of um, dynasties of the time uh, of kings whose genealogies have been preserved tend to uh, call their sons Arthur. This is in the genera two, three generations after the time when Arthur would have lived, which again suggests that there was uh, a famous Arthur after whom they wished to name their sons. And it's interesting too to me that um, most of these kings are in the north of Britain where I suspect um, that the real Arthur lived, possibly based on the old Re Roman legionary fortress at York. Some think that Arthur and Ambrosius, mentioned by Gildas, were one and the same. Geoffrey of Monmouth invented a blood tie between Ambrosius and Arthur by making Arthur the son of Uther Pendragon, who was supposed brother to Ambrosius. But there is no historical evidence for this and no way of knowing who Arthur's parents were or where he was born. It's a commonly held belief that Arthur took up the struggle against the invaders where Ambrosius left off. Unusually, Gildas names Ambrosius, where he'd kept silence about other figures, notably Arthur. Of Ambrosius, he said, Their leader was Ambrosius Aurelianus, a gentleman who, perhaps alone of the Romans, had survived the shock of this notable storm. Certainly his parents, who had worn the purple, were slain in it. It's plain that both Ambrosius and Arthur shared a strong desire to rid Britain of the heathen invaders, or at least to stem the tidal wave of eager Germanic, Pictish and Irish settlers. Perhaps Ambrosius invented Arthur with his authority and passed him the torch to bear onwards into the darkness. Knowing nothing about his background or descent, we can only assume that he must have come from a British family of some importance. The influence of Rome was still very strong in such noble families. Arthur may well have spoken in the local Celtic dialect, a type of primitive Welsh, but he would also have had a working knowledge of Latin as a matter of course. What he looked like and how old he was when he took up the fight, we cannot know. One thing can be said with certainty. He was a British military commander who appeared on the scene in the latter half of the 5th century and succeeded in curbing the Saxon incursions and in parts of Britain actually halting their advance altogether. The battles mentioned by Nennius took place over a wide area of Britain, roughly stretching from Strathclyde, eastwards to Northumbria, or possibly even to Lincolnshire, 
and from Chester to some point southwest where Baden Hill saw a British victory so overwhelming that it subdued the Saxons for the following 50 years. As Gildas puts it, Baden was not the least slaughter of the hangdogs and also almost the last. Only two battle sites of the 12 mentioned by Nennius have been tentatively identified. But the important fact is that they indicate the scope and reach of the military force of which Arthur may have been the leader. Such a force, with its ability to respond to threats from all over mainland Britain, would have cavalry as its main component. The resounding defeat he inflicted on the Saxons at Baden demonstrated superbly that, in a pitched battle, cavalry had the edge over foot soldiers. The tradition of cavalry had been inherited from the Romans, whose most effective troops in the twilight of Rome's power had been their light or fast strike cavalry. The Celts themselves had a reputation for superb horsemanship. Indeed, they had sold their services as auxiliary cavalry the length and breadth of the old empire, and Rome had learned much from them. Now the wheel turned again, and all of that knowledge and experience passed once more into Arthur's hands. It's safe to assume that he, along with Ambrosius, revived the use of cavalry as a hammer with which to break the enemy ranks. We might get a better idea of um, Arthur's strategy if we could identify the battle sites, because they really are, I think, the most tantalising clue. Uh, and it may be that the day will come when one of the sites is properly excavated, and if we find evidence of a battle contemporary, then I think we would obviously be very near. Uh, but we wouldn't know, for instance, whether the battles occurred in successive years or all in the space of one campaign or ever time of the whole of Arthur's lifetime, so we wouldn't know much. Um, it's, it's from the early Welsh poetry we know how the battle was fought. It was, um, they were very stylized. Um, there was considerable use of, of, of cavalry, as I say. The nobles prided themselves rather like medieval knights, so there is a resemblance. Um, but there's nothing unusual about using cavalry. In fact, cavalry was usual among the Britons at that time, and um, I don't believe, and there's no evidence to suggest that this was imitating, as was suggested um, in the Oxford History of England, the armoured knights, the cataphracti of the late Roman Empire. Uh, I don't think so. This was um, an aristocratic form of warfare from these um, hill forts where they had their horses. Uh, and I think as much as anything, it reflects the um, aristocratic prejudice of the poets who are not who are writing for their kings um, and are writing about what they wish to know about, just as um, medieval minstrels write about the adventures of Lancelot and Gawain riding out in armour, but it doesn't mean that everyone did, it just means that the audience wanted to hear about that. But it does still reflect an aspect of the warfare. But there is mention in the poems, allusions, um, that's not their prime interest, in um, ordered movements of troops, and there is an expression forming the battle pen, which does give the impression of a forming up a, a phalanx, maybe, of um, men with spears and shields. Uh, and it would be inconceivable that there wasn't um, some sort of discipline and order, and that indeed that the king, like Arthur, who carved a name for himself, and uh, if it was he won the great victory at Mount Bardon, didn't make use of um, the superior tactics to his adversaries. Equally, the adversaries were obviously uh, very formidable indeed, or, or we wouldn't be speaking English at this interview. In contrast to Arthur's highly mobile and disciplined men, the Saxons mostly fought on foot, as indeed they continued to do right up to the Battle of Hastings. They had no apparent strategy because they had no sense of central leadership. Small bands of Saxons in one community would be loyal to one chief, but fought mainly for the love of it, with the added incentive of rich rewards if they won. Military discipline was not their strong suit and their war gear varied according to their means. Unlike the British under Arthur, for whom uniformity and consistency of equipment, particularly horse harness, would have been essential. In a large force, particularly cavalry, standardization of essential items of equipment would have been the only practical way to make the most of horses and men. Such a demand would have been met by a cottage industry of craftsmen, armorers, leather workers, and perhaps even field surgeons, as well as the more obvious baggage train of cooks and quartermasters.
The logistics of directing so complicated a piece of military machinery indicates that Arthur must have been as capable a diplomat as he was a soldier. For to keep his men and horses fully effective, vast resources would have been needed. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility that the church, with its great wealth, was one of Arthur's main benefactors. But whether it did so willingly or with a little prompting is hard to say. Certainly in the first few centuries following Arthur's lifetime, the record-keeping clergy seem to have been unwilling to give him any credit, as Gilda's silence on the subject of Arthur may perhaps bear witness. Well, as I've said earlier, that the, the direct sources are very sparse and for the most part, unfortunately, not that satisfactory. They require an enormous amount of discussion and evaluation. <clears throat> but I suppose if one were to look for a parallel, it would not be back in the imperial Roman past, uh, nor in the Knights of the Middle Ages, but it would be in what was going on in, in Gaul across the Channel at this time, which is far better documented because people were writing uh, letters and so forth which have survived. And there we do see, I would think, a rather similar picture to Britain. For example, um, you have in northern Gaul um, a Roman leader, Syagrius, who is still acting as a Roman officer, though he's now cut off completely from um, Rome itself. Um, we have in the letters in the 5th century of Sidonius and other people, long correspondence has survived of these Roman aristocrats living on in their villas, sometimes um, perfectly peacefully and, and in, on good terms with the local Gothic king or Frankish king, writing, corresponding, even acting on their behalf. There's a description of a Gaulish um, landlord, landowner, a young and dashing man called Ectidius, who with, I think, a handful of horsemen, I forget the number, a dozen, rides through the whole of a Gothic besieging army in order to relieve the city in um, southern Gaul. So if you read those sources, which are accessible, then I think that gives perhaps a more clear impression of what was going on in Britain than uh, the speculation which were from much later sources which have survived in this country. And one has to remember, too, that uh, historically what happened in Gaul seems to be happening on another planet because we read that as a separate part of history. But the real Arthur, or the real people who lived at that time, the real Kai and Bedouia, Kay and Bedivere, knew what was going on to some extent. They talked with merchants delivering wine at ports on the southern and western coasts. They themselves must occasionally have travelled there. The whole enormous historical events can, can and must have taken place of which we know nothing. And I think, therefore, again, studying the history of Gaul, which is so much better documented, does give one a much um, fairer and more a clear picture. Whilst British resources ensured that each man had the bare essentials, there must have been a fair amount of looting and opportunist stealing, so that as time passed, at least the higher ranks of each side would have had items such as chain mail, helmets, and possibly even swords, which had been taken from the enemy. Arthur's men may have, if they took Rome as their model, carried long straight cavalry swords, or spears, or both. They may have carried shields, but even if they didn't, they would almost certainly have worn body armour of either chain mail, leather armour or scale. The latter is vulnerable to upward thrust, not a wise choice of armour for a cavalryman. Before Geraint, the enemy's scourge, I saw white horses, tensed red. After the war cry, bitter the grave. In Klangborth, I saw the clash of swords, men in terror, bloody heads, before Geraint the Great, his father's son. In Klangborth, I saw spurs, and men who did not flinch from spears, who drank their wine from glass that glinted. In Klangborth, I saw Arthur's heroes, who cut with steel, the emperor, ruler of our labour. In Klangborth, Geraint was slain, heroes of the land of Dovnight. Before they were slain, they slew. Under the thigh of Geraint, swift charges, long their leg, wheat their fodder, red, swooping like milk-white eagles.
When Geraint was born, heaven's gate stood open. Christ granted all our prayer. Lovely to behold, the glory of Britain. Of course, Arthur would have had more than just cavalry at his disposal. The units of foot soldiers he commanded would have been a mixture of the descendants of old soldiers who had served under the regular Roman army, volunteers from the villages and farms, and in the remaining British-controlled towns, any such town militia that could be spared and were acceptable to the Dux Bellorium, the war leader or leader of battles as Arthur is often called. The weapon of choice for an average foot soldier on the British side is likely to have been the spear. Because swords were expensive to produce, they remained almost exclusively the weapons of the nobility or those fortunate enough to acquire them on the field of battle. Shields were the principal form of protection for these poorer British folk who couldn't possibly afford body armour, let alone iron helmets. But unlike the professionally produced and finished shields of the earlier Roman troops, these would have been edged with rawhide and possibly painted in crude copies of the patterns of the Roman legions. Iron helms were rare in the Saxons' ranks too, even amongst nobility. Spears were the most common weapon on both sides. In contrast to the sword, very little skill or training is needed to use the spear effectively enough to injure or to kill. Very few actual weapons have been found from this time that can be said to be definitely British. One reason for this may be that the Britons, being mostly Christians, had abandoned the practice of burying their weapons with their dead, whereas the Saxons, very much still a pagan and warrior society, still persisted in consigning their most treasured possessions, including their swords, spears, mail shirts and helmets to the grave. An old Domini 516 to 518. The Battle of Baden, in which Arthur carried the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ for three days and three nights on his shoulders, and the Britons were victorious. The aim of such a huge infantry army pushing so far into British territory must surely have been to overcome and destroy the main British cavalry force, which was, after all, the only thing standing between them and mastery of all Britain, and also to wipe out the British base. The Saxon army was composed of the armies of Kent and of the South and West Saxons under the overall leadership of Ale and was for those days an enormous force of warriors. Arthur's cavalry was probably no more than a thousand. And if it was a siege, the hard-pressed cavalry needed a steep hill for the dismounted warriors to hold against the greater numbers of the Saxons, and there are many such hills outside Bath. And on one of these hills, Arthur triumphed. At Baden, Arthur crushed the Saxons so thoroughly that it was to take them decades to recover. He created by brute force a breathing space for his fellow Britons. For a while at least, they need not fear the ravages of the Saxon sea wolves. Arthur had won a peace and could expect to enjoy the acclaim of the people. Though he was never a king, he did more than any king of Britain had ever done. Although many of them were of nobler descent than he was, he was nevertheless 12 times designated commander. Peace may have brought Arthur rewards as well as the gratitude of the British. For a warlord of his stature, it would be quite natural for him to seek a permanent stronghold. An ancient hill fort at South Cadbury in Somerset, last inhabited at the time of the Roman invasion, had been shown by archaeologists to have been re-fortified at the end of the 5th century, when Arthur's military career was at its peak. In the centre of this hill fort stood a great feasting hall, with a lofty thatched roof and gabled at each end. Was this the Camelot of legend, where Arthur celebrated his greatest victories? History is so far silent. Anno Domini 539, the Battle of Camlan, 
in which Arthur and Modred perished, and there was a plague in Britain and Ireland. Arthur got his peace and perhaps was able to enjoy it for a short while. The Saxon threat had been warded off and the country could once again flourish. But the old hostilities resurfaced between the petty chieftains. Civil war broke out and Arthur may have been drawn into it. Legend says he and his son died at each other's hands in a fatal power struggle. Yet men say in parts of England that King Arthur is not dead but had by the will of our Lord Jesus into another place, and men say that he shall come again. I will not say it shall be so, but rather will I say that here in the world he changed his life. But many men say there is written upon his tomb this verse, Here lies Arthur, the once and future king.